We're talking to Brandon Caldwell. He's the sports audio editor uh, from Sirius XM Sports. And, uh, again, thank you for being on County Line Sports. My question is this. Do you think six-time champion Jimmy Johnson can get back to championship form? And what happened to him this season? I think this, this, there's a couple of things that go into this. This shows you, I personally believe, this 48 team, I don't want to say sandbagged, but didn't maybe put as much effort into the last half of the regular season to try and test for the intermediate parts of the chase. Five out of the ten races in the chase are intermediate tracks. So if they can use a lot of that information they gained in the last half of the, of the season to the intermediates in the chase, they're focusing just on that ten races. And what happened was, they didn't win maybe as, as many races as they could have, which would have earned them bonus points in the first round, and maybe it would have been an easier time for them to get through the first round. Brent, go ahead. My question is, well, it's a Clint Boyer question. The guy's, huh? the guy's a hot name, but he's never made it past or too far into the chase. You know, how is, huh? he, the, how is he the hot guy? Well, I think it comes, you know, this is NASCAR, and it's a business, and as, we've, as I've read, he was plan B for Tony Stewart. Uh, he was plan B. Uh, Kyle Larson was plan A. Something went on with the Chip Ganassi contract where he just couldn't get out of it. And so Boyer sort of brought in plan B, and he also has five-hour energy in his back pocket, which is a major, major selling point for him. True. It's going to be for 25 races. And it, once Tony retires, who knows where Bash Pro Shops is going? Who knows where his, all of his other sponsors are going? Five-hour energy for 25 races is a really nice base for Tony Stewart to be, have a replacement. That is a major part of why Clint Boyer's there. But he was with Richard Childress Racing in those times, too, which, as they are, they're maybe a mid upper middle level team. They're not really, the, uh, with comparison with the Hendrick Motorsports or the Team Penske, or even the Stuart Haas Racing. So you have to take that into consideration as well as where he was running when he was in those chases. True. Absolutely. And you look at Clint Boyer, you know, he, uh, Michael Waltrip Racing is going to be uh, defunct by the end of this season. And Clint Boyer is going to go off for one season and drive, drive the number 51 car, uh, Harry Scott Motorsports. And the thing is, when he announced that uh, with five hour energy going with him, like you, like you mentioned there, Brandon, uh, that's an important step. And I think that this, everybody says, oh, he's only one year. But I think there's a lot of collaborations going on here with uh, Harry Scott because. When you look at his drivers right now, not really big name guys. Uh, they got Justin Allgaier, and and you're going to have Clint Boyer coming in next season. One season, people say, well, that may not be enough, but the collaboration with Hendrick Motorsports and so forth is going to make that team and take them, I think, to the next level. And not one of these teams that kind of they they qualify, you know, basically they qualify and they park, and, or they don't Absolutely. race the entire race. And yep. I think this is going to change, even for one season for Harry Scott Racing. Well, I. There's obviously more to the deal. Justin Allgaier actually is, is the one that's going to be replaced at H. Scott Motorsports. It's currently, oh, okay. as we sit here in 2015, the two-car team. Uh, Justin Allgaier is the flagship team with the 51 car, and then they have a second team with Michael Annette yes. and uh, the Pilot Flying J sponsorship as well. And that's not going anywhere, Michael Annette. He hasn't had anywhere near the success Justin Allgaier has had this year. And Allgaier is the one that's going to be replaced. Hmm. And if you look at it, you have to say, well, if he's losing a driver who I think is pretty talented than Justin Allgaier, he's giving up on him for one season to have one season at Clint Boyer. Obviously, there's got to be more to the picture than that with the alliance that's going to come with Stewart House Racing. And I've been watching this sports my whole life, and I wouldn't put it past Tony Stewart where, you know, once the. I, I'll look at it, I've said this on my own show. I look at it almost like the Andy Pettit thing. When Andy retired the mm -hmm. first time with the Yankees, he didn't want the Roger Clemens. Uh, investigation to interfere with the team. And everybody said, oh, that had nothing to do with it. Well, as soon as the Clemens investigation ended, Andy Pettit was back in pinstripes. Yep. So maybe Tony Stewart, <laughs> once this Kevin That's Ward Jr. Truth. situation is over, will come back and maybe run five to ten races for Harry Scott Jr. He hasn't won the Daytona 500 yet, and I think that's a race he wants to win. So yeah. I think maybe uh, along with the with the with all the backing that will come with it, Maybe a partial schedule down the line in two to three years with Tony Stewart as well. I wouldn't rule that out at all. No, and you're right. He's won every race at Daytona with the exception of the 500. And, uh, yeah, I think you're right. With the, with the, uh, uh, the fatal accident at the, the sprint car track, you know, uh, in upstate New York, you know, that has just hampered him. Plus, you know, having the multiple surgeries on his leg when he broke that, when he, I believe he was at the Knoxville Nationals when that happened. And, yep. you know, it just, uh, a lot of, Things have happened negatively, and he hasn't been able to recover. Like you said, I think, you know, I never really looked at it that way, but very smart thinking in your part because I think that makes a lot of sense because, you know, he can 
step out and then step back in. He's one of those drivers that can because, well, he's part owner of the team, and I think that makes all the difference. And when you look at the other drivers that didn't make it, uh, you got Paul Menard, Jamie McMurray, and Jimmy Johnson that did not make it. Now, everybody says, you know, six time, you know, what's going on with him? You know what? He's good, uh, but he wasn't good enough, and this season he was good during the regular season, but I think you're right. I didn't think they put a lot of homework into these tracks because the one thing I don't like about the Chase Brandon is they don't really change up the tracks very much. So if you already, you know that, I mean, the the newest change basically is Chicago. They started off, it used to be loud, and mm-hmm. now it's Chicago. I would like to see them throw a road course. I'd like to see them throw a uh, – they already have a super speedway. I'd like to have, you know, like a, a Martinsville, which there is. I want to see every track, at least one track that they um, – not these cookie-cutter mile and a half and all that stuff where these guys – consistently are good. I want to throw some changes every season into the chase. Uh, I agree with you on that one, no question. And, I, and When they first created this chase, when Sprint came in or Nextel came in in 2004, they just said, oh, well, it's going to be the final 10 racetracks, and they really didn't look at it and say, oh, well, this is what we want as, as our chase. It just happened to be whatever was on the final 10 of the schedule, and it's almost pretty much remained the same there. Mm-hmm. Um, they, and there's a lot of things that I don't like about the chase. I don't like this current format with the eliminations and the three, the, each three races eliminations. I just, it's a, I look at it almost like a major league baseball with this wild card game. Yep. And I'm not speaking negatively of it just because my team lost in it last night, but everybody's all up in arms about the wild card game, saying, "Well, you play 162 games and full of three and four game series." And it's going to come down to one game. Right. Uh, that's the way I look at the chase. You know, you run 26 NASCAR Sprint Cup Series races, and it comes down to just whether or not what you do in three or four bad races. To me, I, it doesn't sit well with me. I don't like the per- this part of the chase, and they definitely do need to change up the racetracks there as well. And one thing I've never liked about the chase is there's only one night race in this chase, and mm-hmm. you're going up against the National Football League in the chase. I don't understand why you won't run those races on Saturday nights. It comes down to, I think, with Charlotte and Bruton Smith only wanting the only race, char- only night race in the chase to be at Charlotte. But that's another thing I've never understood about the chase is you're going up against the National Football League on a Sunday afternoon, and how can you expect NASCAR to compete with that? <laughs> you can't. You're right. No, I completely you're agree. You definitely can't. All the, the regular local tracks are already done with their racing, so I would, I would shift them to night races on Saturday night, too. But go ahead, Brent. I can't. Who's got the, uh, the final 12? Who's got the best chance of winning at Charlotte, Kansas, and uh, Talladega? Well, I... Charlotte and Kansas are two intermediate tracks, and you have to look at Joe Gibbs racing. And I'm going to go with uh, Matt Kenseth. He's been very, very consistent. When he was in his heyday at Roush, they were money on the intermediates, and mm-hmm. that's where Joe Gibbs racing is right now. If you look, uh, he won the opening race at Chicago Land Speedway because that's an intermediate track. They've been really, really good at these intermediates. Carl Edwards won the Coca-Cola 600 at Charlotte, and that's when Gibbs still wasn't even that great. They didn't make their strides until the second half of the regular season. Right. So I look at Matt Kenseth as the guy who really can get through here and do really well. Um, he's been phenomenal all season long. He's very, very, very consistent. Well, I, I call him the most underrated driver of the last 15 years in this sport. He, I think, on hands down, not only get through this round, but for the championship, I think he's the favorite at this point. Wow. I think one of the neatest things about the chase, you know, I'm not a big fan, like you said. I, I wish they would change these tracks up, but I know ticket-wise and people for vacation purposes and all that stuff, I know Bruton Smith wants to end the season in Las Vegas because that's where the, uh, the, that, the championship uh, the, the big gala ball is the, is there. They moved it from the uh, Astoria there in New York out to Vegas, and he wants the final race in Vegas. And uh, to be honest with you, I would rather see the season start at Daytona and end at Daytona. That's the way I would like to see it. Uh, but it, they're not going to listen to me, of course. But I like no. the, I like I like I really like the way the, the chase, especially the Contender Twelve. It ends with a wild card race, as I call it, with Talladega, and the next yeah. round opens up with a five hundred lap at the paper clip. In Martinsville. Those two races, I think, are going to be the key races uh, of this chase. To who goes on and, and who's going to win? That, absolutely. As we saw last year, I think Dale Earnhardt Jr. was the name you have to look at last year, where he was really, really strong last year. He got to Charlotte, or uh, sorry, Kansas and Charlotte were reversed last year. So he blew a tire and hit the outside wall after leading a ton of laps at Kansas, then broke a shifter at Charlotte and went to Talladega. And like you said, at the wild card race, so he didn't win it, so he was out. And that can lead to so many different things. And there's a lot of guys on different agendas at Talladega. You got guys like Bobby Labonte and Michael Waltrip trying to run that just to win the race. You have guys who are trying to win a race just to prove that they can win a race. David Reagan is trying to prove his worth for mm-hmm. 2016 to see because he doesn't have a seat right now. Uh, he's trying to prove his worth, and if he can prove that he can win a super speedway race, 
somebody's going to look at that and say, well, there's three of those in the regular season. Heck, we want him to drive our car because if he wins one of those three in the regular season, we're in the chase. So there's a lot of different agendas going on at Talladega, and that's just a crazy race to have right here at the end of this round. So I always say you can never count a championship out in any series as long as there's a super speedway race left. And you can never count anybody out just because you don't know what's going to go on at Talladega. Um, and then Martinsville is a great little racetrack. That's where I think if Jeff Gordon can remain consistent here in these next couple of in this round here, in these next two intermediates, and just get through Talladega with a pulse, Martinsville is the place I'm looking at for Jeff Gordon. It's his final season. He's run really strong there. He led a ton of laps there in the spring and sped on the road and cost himself the win. But if he can get through this round with a pulse and get to Martinsville, I think he can win and get to the, champ- get to the championship round at Homestead Miami Speedway. I agree. I was going to ask you about Jeff Gordon, but you just brought that up. All right, so how about who has the biggest change for next year? It, who's, uh, who's changing the biggest the biggest ride? What's what's the what's the biggest change? Well, uh, NASCAR is trying. They're, they're talking about doing what they're calling franchising, and I've read a million things into it, and they're not getting a lot of information on it. But from what I've read, it's going to be some sort of medallion system, and because of that, there's not any NASCAR does not want these teams to expand. So the, the fact that you're going, I don't think you're going to see any new rides start up for 2016. So that leaves quite a few little options there where you know Ty Dillon may be making the jump to the 33 car, and as long as it remains under the Circus Sport banner, that's not necessarily a new race team. Uh, the nine team at, at Richard Petty Motorsports right now has about six or seven drivers listed to be possible candidates for that ride, really? and I think the leading candidate for that ride right now is David Reagan. And then after that, you have to look at Clint Boyer going to H. Scott Motorsports at the 51. That's a big change. I'm interested to see what H. Scott can do. They're a small team. They only started up a couple of years ago. Can Five Hour Energy is spending a lot of money to sponsor this team, and I understand what's going to come in 2017 and beyond is a huge deal for Clint Boyer and Five Hour Energy, but they're still spending the same amount of money on sponsorship as they would at any other race team. They're going to want to make the chase, and if that team cannot prove that they can make the chase, that could be a setback a little bit there from Five Hour Energy. They could get their noses out of joint a little bit. I wouldn't blame them considering they're still spending the same amount of money. So to me, that's, there's still some pressure on Clint Boyer to make the chase, even though he has his 2017 plan sealed up. Yeah, I thought I thought all along that you know he was going to uh, be reunited with his teammate Martin Truex Jr. at Furniture Row Racing. I thought that they were going to expand to maybe a second car, and I was really surprised when I heard the number fifty one come up uh, because you're right, it, it, it was Justin Algaier who is kind of the veteran of that young organization that is going to be moved around. And David Reagan, of course, Aaron's not coming back. Michael Walter Bracing, uh, don't know where he's going. But the rumor is, like you said, uh, Richard Petty Motorsports. And I think that makes sense because, you know, his last win was at Talladega. And he was, I, yep. if I remember right, his partner uh, was David Gillian that day. And those guys were such underfunded teams. It just goes to show that uh, if anybody can win on any given day, especially at a restrictor plate, uh, but I find that to be interesting, the silly season in full effect. It's not as crazy as years past there, Brandon, because you've had some weird conversations like last year you had uh, – uh, who was it, Carl Edwards, that y- you knew that Roush and uh, things weren't working out and where he was going, and the move to Joe Gibbs, people were like, well, I'm putting my hands up in the air, not sure how that's going to work out. That organization it basically turned into the Hendrick Motorsports of, of NASCAR this season because they were unbeatable. Oh, absolutely. They've been unbeatable all year long. And, you know, the, the Edwards thing still isn't, I think, great where they need to be to win a championship. It's his first season. Uh, they're getting their feet, they're still getting their feet wet with Derry and Grubb as the crew chief. We saw Matt Kenseth having a tremendous first season at Joe Gibbs Racing. We saw Kevin Harvick have a tremendous first season last year at Stuart Haas Racing. But I, I don't have that same feel for Carl Edwards this year. I did just think they're going to make it through the next round here, maybe get eliminated in the, in the third round, and that, and that's that's enough success for me for that team uh, for that 19 team in, the, in year one for for Carl Edwards. But like you said, there was a lot of rumbling for Furniture Racing starting a second team, and I think there's a couple of reasons why they haven't done that. Number one is, uh, obviously, the medallions are the NASCAR's presenting this and expanding, but number two on that is, Eric Jones is going to go cup racing in 2017 for Joe Gibbs Racing, and he needs a seat. And now that they're with Toyota, and maybe they don't want it, they can't dri- sign a driver long-term there because I don't see Gibbs getting rid of any of his drivers in his stable, so maybe that's where Eric Jones ends up in 2017, is with a second team at Furniture Row Racing. Yeah, Eric Jones and uh, Chase Elliott are putting on a show in the Xfinity Series for sure. I, I mean, yep. w- when you look at the uh, the young guns out there, 
Uh, Chase Elliott, you know, it, it, of course, he's the son of Awesome Bill from Dawsonville, you know, um, and, and he's done very, very well. He wins a championship last year in the Xfinity Series. This year, I believe he's right up near the top of the points. And when you look at it, um, it's the young guns. But how would you like to be Chase Elliott, knowing that uh, Bill Elliott, your dad, you know, who set a, a lot of records. He won the Winston Million back in the days and set the track record for speed at Talladega. He's going to be jumping into the number 24 car. And, man, I don't know about you, but <laughs> I don't know if I want the season to end because that's kind of a, a huge, huge jump for him. But I think if anybody that can handle it, I think Chase Elliott is mature enough to do it because uh, he's got a lot of backing and a lot of support in NASCAR. He definitely does. My fear is, you know, I'm 27 years old, I don't know if I was ready to take over a NASCAR Sprint Cup Series ride at 20 years old, let alone for a four-time series champion in Jeff Gordon. <laughs> right and on. we've seen a Big lot shoes. of young drivers come in here with, with high expectations. Uh, Kyle Larson still hasn't gotten his first NASCAR Sprint Cup Series win. If you remember Joey Logano, when he came in and took over for Tony Stewart, mm-hmm. he really, really, really struggled at, at Joe Gibbs Racing to the point where Home Depot completely almost backed out, and now they're completely gone, and he had to change rides and go to Team Penske. Uh, and I could see that happen, and, and Austin Dillon as well hasn't had a lot of success at the Spring Cup level. He's been a disappointment so far. Ricky Stenhouse Jr., the guys who have made jumps have been veteran guys who have made jumps and had success right away, let alone these young drivers. I think, you know, I understand the youth movement in this sport, but I, I, and I understand Rick Hendrick had to make this move because if he didn't bring – Chase Elliott the Cup. Some other owner may have given him an offer to come cup racing, and he would have lost him. I understand that move in a sense, but I'm sa- but don't put too much stock in Chase Elliott next year because I'm not so sure this kid has the know-how and has the experience to go out there and win a championship in year one, year two, or year three. It's going to take some time. I agree with you. Uh, in our Chase talk we've been doing, there's two names that are conspicuously absent from our our uh, talk here today. One is Junior. The other ones are Michigan boy Brad Keselowski. Do they got a mm-hmm. shot? I think Brad Keselowski has a really good shot. People have been picking his teammate Joey Logano as a favorite. I'm not sure Joey's there yet. Brad has proven, uh, he's obviously proven he can win a championship. Team Penske is a very, very, very good team, obviously. And we all know there's something went down with Brad in his personal life in the, in the regular season. He was really struggling. And when it, when it comes between you and your kid, how do you put that out of your mind? I, I don't understand how mm-hmm. anybody, any driver could put that out of my mind. Now that we know it's okay and everything's fine, Brad can focus on being fast again in that race car. And don't count him out. Intermediates are good. Fords have been money on intermediates. Brad's been good on intermediates. Don't count him out at all. He's definitely a guy I would say could definitely make the Final Four. Your other driver, Dale Earnhardt Jr., I'm not so optimistic about. Last year he had Steve Lepard as his crew chief. They seem to have a really good rapport, and I don't see the same thing with him and Greg Ives this season. I don't. Dale's got two wins this year, both at Super Speedway races. I think there's no question they've been. He's looked this year at the plate tracks like he looked back when he was at DEI a decade ago. They've been that strong on the on the plate tracks this year. But other than that, they haven't been too terrific. Dale barely made it through this round with all kinds of problems right. this year. Right. Barely made it through this round. His two wins is what got him through to the round because that was the tiebreaker with Jimmy McMurray. I'm not in love with where Junior is in that 88 this year. I'm really questioning whether or not they're going to make it through this second round here, especially because the Gibbs Toyotas have been really, really, really strong on the intermediates, and that's really where Hendrick is sort of taking a step back this season. Right. And there's two in, this, in these three races here in this round. I, I completely agree with you. I think his only salvation would be uh, Talladega. When you talk about somebody that just barely got in, Kevin Harvick was had to be win and you're in to move on to the next step, and Boy, did he dominate Dover. But something that happened at the very end that is causing yep. some drivers to talk is the fact that, you know, every driver does a burnout. And everybody does their own way. Well, he decided, and I don't think he decided he's not going to admit to it, but a lot of drivers are saying that he intentionally ruined the back end of his car when he hit the wall uh, because his car may have been a little bit illegal. They can't take it back to Charlotte to do the uh, at the NASCAR tech and all that stuff and the inspections. Now, I posted an interview, or an act- uh, not an interview, but an in-car audio from 2011 with Jimmy Johnson and Chad Canals where you know, Chad Canals 
comes into the cockpit of the car and tells Jimmy Johnson to intentionally wreck. If you win, you need to destroy the rear end of this car. He's not telling them why. You know, it, the thing is, NASCAR, if you're not cheating, you're not racing. And, and, Absolutely. And, and, and you, only, you only cheat if you get caught, basically. And these guys walk a very fine line, as you know. The, 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 we call it the doom and gloom room when everybody inspects and re-inspects. And you've got the shells that everybody goes on with these cars of tomorrow and the perfect fit. Everybody looks the same. But there's still things going on that happen between the inspections. And it ha- this happened for since the beginning of NASCAR. I was telling Brent, I went to Daytona, USA, and you can see, um, I believe it was Tim Flock that actually had gasoline in his roll bar because he wanted to get better gas mileage than the other mm-hmm. people. I mean, it, this has been going on forever. Uh, but I think it's the competitors saying, and this guy came out of nowhere. I think they forget he won the chase last year, and he's got to be favored to win it again this year. We see for his for the record, we've seen this team when they've needed to win, they've won. They won the final race uh, of the third round last mm-hmm. year. Phoenix uh, Phoenix to get them into the championship round last year. Obviously, the yep. one in uh, you know one race is all that matters at Homestead Miami Speedway. They won that to win the championship. Then they won this this weekend at Dover. I will say this though. It rained all weekend in Dover Downs. It only had, I think, two practices on Saturday, and he went out and dominated that badly. What did they roll off the truck with? <laughs> Listen, this has been going on for a long, long time. There's the stories about Daryl Walter potentially blowing an engine in an all-star race one year for Junior Johnson mm-hmm. because the engine was illegal as soon as he crossed the start-finish line. I don't put that past anybody, and you have to understand, too, they run with these competitors every week. And if their competitors are opening their mouths and saying something, there's probably a pretty good chance they thought something was up with that <laughs> rear end of that race yep, car. Right, yep. Because they, they know that if there's something up with their race car, Kevin Harvick now isn't going to have any qualms to rat them out now, too. So they, they also, and those drivers understand that better than anybody. So if they're accusing him of something, there might be some legs to this, especially since, you know, Kevin Harvick, we saw him get around Dover real fast. Real, and all of a sudden, during a burnout, he can't keep the car off the wall. <laughs> I, I, you know, there's, there's, that, that to me, I look at and I say, "Oh, there's some skepticism there." A so fishy. I, I wouldn't put it past Kevin Harvick, no question. And you got to do what you got to do. Absolutely. And uh, I just thought it was kind of funny because the drivers that did, uh, you, you know, not stay anonymous, they decided to, uh, you know, say what they had to say. But it, and like Harvick said, you know, they're competitors. You know, I, I, I would, I, I would be uh, ashamed if they didn't try to push the envelope and say things like that because this is the chase. This is it. You know, it's it's a matter of winning races, placing, moving on. You know, uh, there was back in the days where the, these guys would win and when they didn't have the chase. You know, uh, Dale Earnhardt and these guys were, were winning by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of points to where the last five races didn't really mean anything because he was going to win it anyhow. But that just goes to show how dominant those guys were back in the days. And if that same dominance, would that be as good now in the chase as it was back then? I'm not so sure because I think... I think racing has completely changed, especially with this car of tomorrow. Oh, yeah. And I will say another thing, too. And people, are, you know, they can call me conspiracy theorist all they want. There is a heck of a lot more debris cautions in 2015 than there was in 2005, mm-hmm. in 1995, and 1985. There's a lot more debris cautions now than there was back then. And there's conveniently one thrown a lot of times with 10, 15 laps to go, depending on what racetrack you're at if somebody dominates the race as much as Kevin Harvick did on Sunday. Mm-hmm. And we've seen, so they, they find debris, and I call it, you know, you can't spell debris without BS. Yeah, Caution. <laughs> I agree. Uh, <laughs> you know, they bunch the field back up, and so you don't have that dominating anymore. But we used to see this all the time. So when people say, oh, well, the sport's not as, you know, uh, it's a lot more competitive than it was back then. Well, it's hard for me to believe that because we do see the debris cautions, mm-hmm. and we see, uh, see a performance like we saw by Kevin Harvick, and what we saw from Matt Kenseth at, at, at Chicagoland was a dominant performance as well. Mm-hmm. I completely agree with you, and I remember when I was uh, when I went to Michigan and uh, the infamous Jimmy Spencer water bottle came flying yes. out of his car, and I'm like, I was sitting at the entrance of Pitt Road, and I'm like, what is that? And I'm like, it's dry, it's going, it's going and going. As you know, they got 18 degrees of banking there. Well, that water bottle somehow stayed up on the track, and they called for a debris caution, and they were able to to get all the cars together, and they ended up not wadding the cars up. That's the same race that Jimmy Spencer decided to go back there and punch Kurt Busch in, yeah. in the face, and we got to we got to see that up close and personal. But uh, oh, yeah. I, I want to ask your your opinion here, Brandon, as as we're gonna uh, we're gonna end this interview here. I know you're a busy man. 
we got to wrap up the show here. Who is winning this year's 2015 Chase Cup? Who is winning the Sprint Cup this season? I know I'm not going to sit well with a lot of Michigan fans because I'm not going to pick Brad Keselowski, but i got to go with Matt Kenseth. I'm high on him this year. He's consistent enough. He's a veteran. This team is where, where they need to be. And the Joe Gibbs Racing this season made Coochie changes to every single one of their race teams other than the 20 team, Jason Radcliffe and Matt Kenseth, they kept together. Mm-hmm. And to me, that, that means a lot because they have a bunch of, I think this is their third chase together now. They've done this before where the other three teams, the other, his other three teammates haven't done this with their crew chief yet. So to me, that makes Matt Kenseth the favorite, his veteran, the way he dominates at, at intermediates. And he runs so well also at the plate tracks as well. If you look at it, to me, Matt Kenseth is the favorite to get through and go to Homestead Miami Speedway and win this thing. Um, I think Kevin Harvick is also a favorite to win. Uh, and Brad Keselowski is going to be there, too, at the end, I think. But I think the number one favorite is definitely Matt Kenseth at this point. Wow. Well, I, I'm looking at it as, as I, I, I agree with you about 50% there. I think Kenseth definitely is going to be there. Um, the rest of the Joe Gibbs stable, I'm not so sure they're going to make, make it to, uh, to Miami Homestead Speedway to be the final four for sure. But I definitely go with Kenseth. I would definitely go with Harvick. I think my sleeper in this deal is, is going to be uh, Martin Truex Jr. I think he's going to be able to slip in to the uh, final four. And also, I think think, and this is just me, I think Joey Logano is going to find his way uh, to maybe not win in every segment, but have enough points to move on and get into the Final Four, and uh, I'm... I'm I'm a Chevy guy, and I really like uh, I really like uh, Chevy drivers. But I think Joey Logano, if he keeps his head where it belongs, I think that uh, this could be uh, his season to break through and win a cup. Well, I, I you're not wrong on that. But I will say one thing about Martin Truex Jr. They're currently with Chevrolet in a line with Richard Childress Racing. Mm-hmm. Next year, we all know they're going to Toyota. Yes. When does RCR step on that hose for Furniture Racing and say, you're not getting any more information from this team to possibly beat us in a championship in 2015? That, to me, is a major, major question. And why I wouldn't make, would, may not have made the manufacturer announcement just yet for this 78 team. And I had them being out after the first round. I'm surprised they got through the first round. I don't think they're going to be there but just for that reason. And they're a single-car team. These conglomerate big race teams that they're going up against are rolling out new chassis and all kinds of new information to go further into this chase than that team. But I will agree with you. Logano needs to keep his head, but he hasn't done that yet. And I'm not so right. sure 2015 is the year he's going to do that. Yeah, I think Childress already pulled the plug on the uh, information of Truex because uh, – I think he's going to have to make it on grit and determination alone because, like you said, they're going to be a single-car team. No more information coming their way because they're splitting off to Toyota. I completely agree with you on that. And, Brent, you have your pick who you think is going to win it all. I think it's going to be the Blue Deuce, but never count out the Bush brothers. Yeah. well, Kyle's won a million times. Don't count him out. <laughs> he's never won a, he hasn't won a, ra- a chase race since 2005 and he's in Hendrick Motorsports. Not yet, baby. Don't but, you worry. Uh, I, think, yeah. I, I think the crunchy M&Ms or the pretzel M&M guy may, uh, may win a race or two. But uh, again, yeah. Brandon Caldwell, thank you so much for your time and your knowledge on NASCAR. And uh, boy, this is exciting. I'd love to be able to talk to you maybe, uh, maybe once um, e- during each phase of the chase and then maybe talk, uh, give a preseason or a postseason wrap up uh, if you got time. And if you'd like to come back on the show, we'd love to have you. Definitely. Anything, anytime you need me, I'd definitely come back. All right. Well, that's you, Brandon, Brandon Caldwell. He's a sports audio editor at Sirius XM Radio NASCAR. The guy's awesome.